by ClubWWI.com members. I'm standing by this week with somebody that, well, if you ever heard his name once, you never forgot it because it was probably one of the catchiest names in wrestling. Uh, he's been in the rough, but at the end of the day, he's a true diamond. Guys, the one and only Simon Diamond himself, Mr. Pat Kenny. Pat, how are you? Good. James, how are you? Good, good. Really glad to have you on. Uh, I, I appreciate you taking the time to talk to our uh, our listeners today. Sure, no problem. i got to tell you, right off the bat before we even start, um, one of the weirdest things with, with talking to you, when I got your number, I was, I was writing down the numbers that I had, and I kept going back and forth whether or not to put it in as Pat Kenny or Simon Diamond. Because <laughs> it's, it's the kind of thing where you actually made a change after, after many years of going to, to using your real name of Pat Kenny, and I have to say it's yeah. so tough because it was such a catchy name, Simon Diamond. Is it tough for people to... To get used to, to calling you a Pat or maybe in the locker room if they were used to Simon Diamond, was it hard to make the transition back to, uh, to I guess, your real name? Well, I thought, yeah, I mean, I guess I'm one of the few guys who always wanted to be called uh, by my real name. I didn't want to be called uh, Simon. And, I mean, that's not to say I didn't, I, I loved it anyway. I thought it was great. And, uh, you know, but I just wanted to be called, you know, after I transitioned out of the ring and became an agent, I just wanted to be... Uh, Called by my real name, yeah. So to speak, it's it's tough for a lot of uh, a lot of wrestlers have different rules with that. I remember Raven had done a, a blog about how he hated if somebody ever used his real name. And then there's other guys who, if you, if you walk up and you call them by their wrestling name, they look at you like you're insane. <laughs> it's kind of like a weird. Kind I mean, of thing. I'm not gonna. It really doesn't matter to me. Mm -hmm. um, well, but, know, what they what they call me. Well, I want to ask you, before we get into it, a lot of fans are obviously familiar with what you're up to now and, and things that you're doing, but for anybody who's not, why don't you fill them in a little bit about what's going on in the world of uh, Pat Kenny right now? Well, I, um, other than listening to my dog barking at someone in the background, um, I'm an uh, agent now with TNA. Um, I help uh, guys with their matches. And, um, I help, uh, help out with um, getting the correct shots um, to the director uh, and the cameraman when the uh, matches are in the ring. Okay. So one, of the, one of the best things about, about TNA, and we've spoken to, obviously interviewed a lot of people who, who have been in your position. Uh, Scott Moore was just on, you know, D'Lo Brown hosted a show for a while with us, or still does actually. Um, and one of the things that I find really cool about TNA is that a lot of the, the producers, as they call them, are, are fairly young. I mean, you're just a few years older than me, I think, or around the same age. Uh, Scott's about my age. Uh, and it's such a different dynamic because, you know, I mean, obviously everyone looks at WWE because it's the other company, but uh, a lot of their agents are, are people who have been retired from the business. But you guys kind of have a, have more of a youthful eye on, on some of the matches in the ring. Do you think that, that kind of changes the approach, and, and do you think it gives the, uh, the show a different feel? Oh, most certainly. Um, I think one of the... <clears throat> things that TNA has done is, in regards to their producers as opposed to the WWEs, um, it, there really was never a prerequisite. I think one of the things in the WWE to be a, pre to be a, a uh, producer there is, um, number one, you've had to have wrestled there, and number two, um, you had to have been there for a period uh, of time. Um, I don't, I think TNA, um, especially Jeff, because he's the one, um, who's made, who makes the decision, decisions on the producers. I think what he wanted to bring in was a different perspective than just, um, that quote unquote, I guess, old school, um, type of producer slash agent. And, you know, I, I consider myself to have an old school mentality, but I'm certainly well aware of, what today's wrestling fan wants to see. And I think that when you can, you, you have more of a, a younger approach to the business, you may not be as jaded or numb to that new style. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that can benefit TNA by being able to get that across um, in its style of wrestling. And certainly whenever you're competing against someone in a business you, you have to be able to offer the consumer a different product. And I think our wrestling style is different than what WWE is offering. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it kind of seems, too, I think one of the, one of the strangest things you bring up is that, that kind of the mentality of old school versus new school. And I think one of the things that um, a lot of times people forget is that since everything is, is basically based on kind of old school, 
school mentality when, when you approach matches and angles, but sometimes that, that kind of fresh perspective allows you to, to figure out a way to, to skew it a little bit. It's not necessarily about reinventing the wheel, but maybe taking something that was, you know, really worked at one point and, and updating it for 2008 like they did with the movies. That, that's exactly it. I mean, you know, through, um, through that innovation, sometimes it becomes, you know, the standard. Um, you know, I, I always use this analogy. Um, when Eddie Van Halen came on the scene in 1978, uh, when Van Halen won, hit, hit the stores, and of course, uh, his solo on the, on the album was Eruption. Before that time, nobody, no guitar player really played and came up with the set sound and tone that Eddie Van Halen did. After that point, everybody tried to be Eddie Van Halen, but there was only one Eddie Van Halen. And I think a lot of times, if we can take what is the standard and reinvent it, not reinvent it so much as just tweak it yeah. and put a new, fresh perspective on it, then we can reintroduce the standard. Absolutely. Is there any particular part of TNA that, that you've worked with that you're most proud of? I know Scott talked about uh, working with the knockouts, uh, but I mean, is there any particular, maybe a, a moment that, that you were a producer for or something that, that you consider uh, kind of your, your pet project with TNA? Um, I seem to always get um, the crossover celebrities who come into TNA, um, AJ Brzezinski, Matt Damon, uh, Johnny Damon. I used to call him Matt Damon when he was with the Red <laughs> <laughs> Because uh, I'm a Yankees fan, so. But now he's uh, Johnny Damon. Um, the NASCAR guys came in. Uh, what else? But I, I seem to get those types of people. And I take a lot of pride in the fact that I can, I can number one, relate to them on an athletic level because I was an athlete all my life. And number two, I try to make make them see wrestling um, as the showmanship aspect of it and not so much as the athletic aspect of it. And so I take a lot of pride in, in trying to get them into the right spots or whatever it is. I just see, I just always seem to get the, uh, you know, the crossover celebrities. Mm -hmm. well, well, you did you did baseball though initially. I mean, that was one of the things that I'd read about you is before you got into wrestling, you were actually uh, you know, as an athlete, you played baseball. Was that right? Yeah, um, I played uh, baseball in college. Um, I actually just retired. I was still playing in a, a semi-pro league um, up to last year. Okay, last year and I just retired. Last year was my last year, and uh, you know, I played as a kid. All through high school, I played football, basketball, baseball my whole life. And, you know, sports, uh, I'm a humongous sportsman. And, you know, I always I always try to take a more sports-oriented approach towards wrestling um, as far as dealing with dealing with people and, and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Well, at the end of the day, too, they always say, because uh, one of the funny things I always thought about wrestling was that so often people talk about MMA, and they say, you know, well, wrestling is different than MMA. And it's like, well, at the end of the day, it, it, it should also be kind of confusing to fans in a way. They should approach professional wrestling, and there should always be that kind of spark that, you know, maybe this is, you know, it's approach is a legitimate sport. I mean, it's entertainment, obviously, but the idea, I guess, is always to, to make the fans kind of think that they're watching an athletic contest and, and forgetting that it's uh, choreographed or predetermined or whatever word they want to use for it. Sure. I, I'll be the first one to tell you that, that wrestling is entertainment, but uh, in the same breath as that, at the end of the day, there's still a winner and a loser. Mm -hmm. And when you have a winner and a loser, then you're going to divide your audience into, you know, the old school realm was babyface versus heel. I say today it's more as the person that you're going to cheer for and the person that you're not going to cheer for. And it's, it, but at the end of the day, it's still winning versus losing, which is, I believe, still the most dramatic storyline that you can tell is that question.
question mark of who will win. And I think one of the, the, the um, March Madness that just completed with Kansas beating Memphis, and too bad I did horrible in my uh, <laughs> playing pool. Uh, <clears throat> but, uh, you know, one of the reasons why it is so successful and so highly watched is the upsets. Now, certainly this year was, um, I think, the first year in history that all the number one seeds made it to the top four. But, uh, you know, I, I believe that um, basketball, baseball, football really are no different than wrestling in the fact that they are entertainment. I mean, we watch them, you, you know, we watch them for entertainment value. But at the same time, um, we're also watching them to see the winning and the losing. And, you know, if you ask people, they'll tell you the, you know, very similar things about wrestling. I mean, the true mega matchups in the history of wrestling have all come down to one thing. Who's going to win? Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things that you guys did recently, I mean, I don't know how much you had to do with it, but I, I thought was was actually one of the best things that the TNA had done. I mean, there were a couple of things with it that I said, well, maybe it's a little off here, a little off there, but for overall, I thought it was great, was uh, the main event of the last pay-per-view with Samoa Joe and Kurt Angle wrestling in an M MMA style, and, and the reason why is it's something that's come up before, I know Kevin Sullivan has talked about it, uh, the mentality of a lot of fans who, who aren't ready to accept, uh, you know, that, that the winners and losers aren't decided in the ring every time, uh, a lot of them like to tell themselves, well, wrestling may be fake, but the, the title matches are always real. And I think at the last pay-per-view, it was one of those situations where it kind of felt that way. I mean, you got to the to the title match, and I think if any fan was was kind of iffy on, on how things were, I, I think that pay-per-view might have convinced them that, that maybe that title match was real, because it's just based on the way it kind of played out. I, I definitely think it was different, and I think that was the main thing that stuck out in the fans' minds. And, and again, <clears throat> we're trying to offer a product that's different from our competitor, and when we can do things like that, because they haven't done anything like that yet. And when we can do that, then it makes us different and it'll stand out. Yeah. And, I mean, I, I believe they did a, a very, very good job of that. Absolutely. What do you feel about your career? Because, I mean, you had the distinction of getting to work in uh, an ECW, the original ECW, not the uh, whatever this is now on that they have out there. The, the Vince Championship Wrestling. The Vince Championship Wrestling. I had, we, I interviewed Jazz, and I said, I said, you were part of the original ECW. I said, it's different than the new ECW because, and she just went, it sucks, and that was, <laughs> we just left it at that. But let me ask you, because people talk about that first, uh, that, that locker room in the original ECW in, in a way that I've never heard anyone talk about a locker room like that again, whether it was, you know, uh, WCW, WWF, everyone says the ECW locker room was great and just the camaraderie. For you getting to work in that environment, what was it like, especially, uh, I guess, at that point in your career, because it was still fairly early on in your career at that time? Um, it was a very, <clears throat> it was a very tight locker room, and I believe a lot of that was due to the fact that um, Paulie put the locker room into the hands of boys, it was an old school locker room, the fact that, you know, there was a lot of uh, um, wrestling etiquette, there was a lot of um, paying of the dues, there was a lot of giving the proper respect to the ones that have paid the way for you. I, I mean, when I first came in there, you know, I was, I was terrified, you know, because I'd heard all the stories. You know, and, and I mean, I didn't say anything to anyone for, geez, eight months maybe. I mean, I, I looked at the floor for eight months. And, you know, whenever I, I was sitting down and, and a veteran came into the locker room and said, you know, uh, I remember one time Taz walked in the locker room and there was no, everyone was sitting down on a chair and Taz looked around and I saw this, like, school, like frown on his face and I just popped up, picked up my chair and brought it around and I said, Taz, you can have my chair. <laughs> and I'll just stand. You can have my shoes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that you can have my boots. Um, you know, and it's, I think the reason for that was is because Paulie just kind of threw it to the boys and said, police it as you will amongst yourself. Yeah. You can't do that in today's wrestling, and here's why. Because when you're dealing with the corporations and you have to answer to somebody, WWE has to answer to the stockholders. TNA 
we have to answer to Spike Television. So when you have that, you can't just allow the boys to run the dressing room the way they want because you're going to have hazing incidents. You're going to have um, incidents where somebody may rough up another person. So you have to run it more as a, you know, <clears throat> corporate structure than as opposed to ECW, which was just basically a mom and pop family run atmosphere and, you know, the boys police themselves and do with it as you will. You know, I saw many instances in ECW where <clears throat> somebody got out of line, quote unquote, and he was put back into line by one of the wrestlers. I, I saw that, you know, at least a dozen times. Um, that's not as um, popular today because it's a whole different environment. And there's also a different mentality today, I think, with a lot of the younger guys then as opposed to um, when I was in East Philadelphia. It also kind of changes, too, the, uh, the people who work. I think... Uh a lot of it had to do with a lot of the people, too, in ECW. There were, there were some, you know, hardcore guys and that old school kind of mentality. And now today's wrestling, I mean, you said before WWE and TNA, you guys both kind of have that same approach where it's, it's, it's more corporate than it ever was. And I think Kid Cash, you know, Kid Cash had even said that when he, uh, when he was in ECW, it was so different than when he was in TNA and he had, he had a lot of the problems that he had there. Um, I mean, do you think that people are starting to get used to it? Is it starting to become the way the business is now? A couple of years ago, when, when it first started, people were all up in arms, dress codes, this and that. But it, it kind of seems like uh, like people are trying to settle into it and, and in some ways even like it better than, than the old way of doing things. Well, you either, I mean, either, unless you're a big money draw, you either dot your I's and cross your T's or you, you get fired. <laughs> luck on your future endeavors. I mean, you know, at a very, very young age, I remember my father telling me, like, you know, there's, there's two types of people. So there's people who um, make money for the companies that they work for. Those people are allowed slack. There, then there's people who don't. Those people aren't allowed slack. So if you're not making extravagant amounts of money for the company, dot your I's and cross your T's, and you'll be okay. If you're making extravagant amounts of a money for whichever company you work for, then you're allowed a little slap. <laughs> you know, it's, yeah. it's at every level. It, it's at Major League Baseball. It's at, you know, I mean, NFL draft is tomorrow. And, you know, there's all this uh, caution about there. Uh, hold off one second. Come on, Come on. Left side. There's all this, you know, uh, mystery surrounding Darren McFadden. In my opinion, the best football player in the draft is Darren McFadden. But there's a lot of um, walking on eggshells to draft him because he comes with some baggage. His family history is not good. He, he's had several brothers in and out of jail, father, I believe. So there's going to be that trepidation to draft him. But if that was it, if that was say a middle of the round running back from Central New Jersey Polytechnical Institute of Statistics, no one would even be talking about. But because the upside with a guy like a Darren McFadden is so high, people will roll the dice, and and, and that's that'll be from now until you know the year three thousand. It'll always be like that. Yeah. Well, especially in this, and in this business, especially too, I think that the personalities are, are you know just as big, if not bigger, than, than a lot of the other sports too. That a lot of these guys, and plus too, a lot of these guys they go to different territories, and when they go to a new territory, sometimes they're so used to whatever cloud that they had in their, in their old, uh, the old company that they worked for, that a lot of guys come in and, and right off the bat think that they're on one level, and, and it doesn't take much to get knocked back down and, and realize that you're just part of a group. And, and I've always, I, I've always said, you know, I was never. I was never a main event guy, but I. But now in the position that I'm at, and dealing with some of the main event guys and seeing how they operate, and I've 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 always said since I've started to, you know, since I became a producer, I started interacting with the main event guys and seeing how they operate. I've always said number one, to be ultra successful in this business, you have to be somewhat selfish, and number two, you also have to challenge. Um, <clears throat> the storylines and 
whatnot from time to time because you know your character better than anyone else. So it's not so much as, um, you know, I, I don't want to do that. It's more of, I like that, but here's, how about this idea? Like when I hear an idea that I believe can help whatever it is that we're trying to get across as a company, then I'll take that idea and I'll bring it back to Dream and I'll say, this is what this person thinks. What do you think? Because nobody knows their character better than their own, than the person who plays it. Yeah. Well, that probably shows management, too, if, if you're willing to, to kind of think of your, I mean, that's a, that's a good thing at, at any job. If you're willing to think of, of ways to improve your own uh, your own career and you show that with management, it shows, uh, you know, you're willing to, to do extra work. Yep. Absolutely. Well, one of the things that you've done, and I, and I always thought this was great because, I mean, you say you were never a main event guy, but you were probably one of the more memorable guys that I've seen just based on, on a lot of your, your catchphrases and the things that you did in the ring. Uh, and what I always liked about you, it's, it's very similar uh, when I think of you to almost Ken Kennedy in that you guys both have very strong personas. I've heard that a lot. Yeah, but there's no gimmick. Yeah, I mean, if, if somebody came to me and said, what's Simon, what was Simon Diamond's gimmick? I don't know what Simon Diamond's gimmick is, but I know that he's a character and he's unique and I, I can pick him out. Uh, for you approaching just the character that you ended up playing as Simon Diamond, everything from, from Simon has a problem and all that, how did that all come about and what was some of the inspiration that you had for it? Um, Paul pulled me aside one time in the <clears throat> ECW arena, like, after about six months, I think, and said, uh, you know, when I first, when I was on the independence as Lance Diamond, and then I came into ECW as Simon Diamond, uh, you know, one of the things was that I, at the time, the thing that was hot was that Eddie Guerrero, Di Malenko feud where, you know, chain wrestling and, and counter wrestling was very hot. So, you know, to be current, I studied a lot of it. I basically studied Dean Malenko, who I believe is the greatest um, chain wrestler that, you know, holds and stuff like that, counter wrestling. He was phenomenal. So I studied him a lot. <clears throat> so one day Paul pulls me aside and he says, you remind me of Dean Malenko a little bit. So what I'm going to do is this. You're going to have his real name, Simon, and you're going to be Simon Dunn. Simon says do this, Simon says do that, Simon blah 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 blah. I said, oh great. So then I just kinda then it just kinda morphed on its own and I think it was actually Raven who came up with the idea of putting um Dick Hertz was a guy in the developmental area in uh WCW was down at the uh, power plant mm-hmm. and he did he was hanging around and he was trying to get in and Raven came up with an idea and he said, put him with Simon and, you know, just have him uh, be Simon's bodyguard. And I was like, well, <clears throat> you know, this guy's, you know, everyone's done the bodyguard gimmick, so, you know, why don't we do a um, implied gay thing? You know, you see two good-looking guys hanging out, and if a girl says to her boyfriend, you know, uh, those guys are attractive, then the then the guy will say, I bet you they're gay. Yeah. <laughs> you know, Absolutely. Like, that's a natural reaction. So I thought of that. I was like, you know what? I think we can get some mileage out of this. So then we started to do the, you know, the whole implied um, gay thing. And then um, he had some pretty, he had some problems. And uh, uh, he left ECW. And then they put uh, Mitch and, Prodigy, Tom Marquez, Prodigy, um, Angel Orsini, who else did they put me? Uh, and then that morphed into Swinger and I becoming a tag team. Okay. Um, when I was doing the implied gay thing, it was with Dick Hurts. It was the easiest thing to come up with lines because everyone in the locker room was coming up to you giving you lines. Okay. Because it was like such a sophomore joke. It was funny. And everyone, you know, oh, I thought of this great line. Say this. You know, I remember Lance Storm telling me one time, you know, I, I got an idea for you. Go out there and, and talk about Dick, you know, in the third person. You know, Simon's Dick and Simon's Dick is this and all that. 
Well, that's a good idea. It's pretty funny. You know, and then, I mean, from there, you know, it's just, you know, it's just, it's just a bunch of, you know, dick jokes. Yep, yep. And, you know, it's stuff like that. And so, you know, to say, where did I get the inspiration from? I mean, everybody in the locker room was coming up to me giving me ideas. That's funny. So it was, it was you know, uh, it was pretty easy. It like grows. It takes on a life of its own after a while until eventually the, yeah. it's not a gimmick anymore. It just starts to, to morph into, into yeah, a personality. Yeah, it was just, you know, it was just, I would just be sitting around watching television. I was like, oh, and I'd come up with something. Well, I'll, I'll use that next week, I'll, you know. And as far as the wrestling side of it, when I first started, I was a big fan of uh, Tony Blanchard. Okay. And because the reason why is because I I looked at myself and I said, well, you know, I'm not an overly big guy. I'm, you know, six six foot six one, two twenty five. You know, and Tully was not a real big guy, but Tully was a, was phenomenal at being the guy that you hated and you never cheered. He was the only guy in the horse who never got cheered. Yep. And everyone else got cheered. Only got even only got cheered. Arn, Wyndham, Luger, Flair, they eventually all turned face. Except for Tully, always was a heel because he was such a strong hip persona, and he looked like the kid. Uh, this is what I always say about Tully. Tully was the guy who was <clears throat> standing at the bus stop or walking by the bus stop where the public kids were. He was walking by the bus bus stop, and as he was walking by the bus stop, a couple of the public school kids would surround him and say, we're going to beat you up. And he was like, no, no, I never, I didn't say that. You know, did you say that, that you were better than me in football? No, no, I never, I didn't say that. You're, you know, he's lying. And let's go over to his house today and I'll prove it to you. And then Tully would get picked up in the Mercedes Benz and he'd be driving to his private school. And as he's driving by the kids waiting outside for the bus in the public school, he'd be waving at him, giving them that, that, that smear. Mm -hmm. That was Tully Blanchard, and that's what made it so effective. Right? Early on in my career, I always watched and tried to study his manner. Not so much his wrestling, but his mannerisms and, and his facial expressions and stuff like that. And to me, he was um, one of the greatest heels, one of the top five heels in the business because he was he never got cheered. He, he also did. I mean, one of the things I loved about Tully was he did such subtle things. I, I remember... Um you know, sometimes if the heel wanted the, the baby face tag team partner to run in and have the referee get distracted, he would run over and hit him in the corner. And with Tully, I remember, he would spit at the baby faces and they'd run in. So it was like, not only was he doing kind of a, a heel thing, but he was actually taking it to a new level because he wasn't even running over and hitting him. He was, he was actually spitting from across the ring to make it even less of a, of a manly thing to do. It was amazing. He was the, I mean, he was the bratty kid that, you know, was really good at sports and, you 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 got so mad because you wanted to beat this little punk kid, but he kept on finding ways to beat you. Yep. And then he would shove it down your throat. See, it, it's it's cool getting to talk to talk to somebody who, who actually came up watching the business before you got into it. And and as somebody who did that, do you find now like when you get to work with uh, you know say somebody that you grew up watching, how strange is it for you uh, even as a producer now with TNA when you run into guys and you know I used to watch you or I've seen this guy. Uh, is, is it weird being a fan who's, who's in the in the position that you're in now? Is it weird being a uh, being, being a former fan who you know kind of came up watching wrestling before you got into it, and now you're you're working with guys who uh, some of which you may have watched on on television throughout the years? It is strange. I mean, you know, when the first man, the first um, first show I ever went to, the main event was Bob Backlund as uh, WWWF champion versus. Hulk, the incredible Hulk Hogan match by Fred Blessing. Okay. Wow. Like May, I'll even give you the date, May 10th, 1978. Crazy. Around there. And uh, I went up with my cousin, my uncle. My cousin was a big wrestling fan, and my uncle, we always would talk uh, his father into uh, taking us up there. My parents absolutely hated wrestling. They wanted nothing to do with it. And um, fast forward to some 30 years later, and that I was, you know, a producer for several Bob Backlund's matches when he was in TNA, and I was just like, you know, I remember calling my cousin, I was like, you know, how strange, how crazy is this? You know, you just never know, I mean, you know, but that's the beauty of it, and, and, and every now and then, you know, I've learned now that I don't wrestle anymore, I've learned to 
to step away sometimes and try and view it as an insert person and try and look at it and say, wow, this is really cool. Yeah. Well, Dave, that, that's kind of like, I mean, people have asked about doing these interviews sometimes, and it's always like I try to disassociate that. Like like right now, like talking to you, I, I disassociate from watching you on TV before, but it's, uh, you know, you're still the same guys. It's kind of a weird thing. Sometimes you have to step out of the, the situation in order to approach it as a, uh, you know, a, as an independent kind of uh, observer. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, let me ask you, is one of the things you got to do uh, that to this day people still bring up, and it, it must have been cool for you, you said before about Tully Blanchard, you got to be in the, the Extreme Horseman. Uh, yes. in Major League Wrestling with, uh, I think, Steve Carino, C.W. Anderson, um, yeah, and, and got to do a lot of different things. Just Incredible, I think, was in it. Yeah. Uh, for you as somebody, oh, sorry, and as somebody who came up uh, with the, uh, you know, watching the original Horseman and Tully Blanchard, how was it for you to be in the Extreme Horseman and, and get to, uh, in some ways, be, be kind of, uh, you know, an add-on to that, uh, to, to a classic stable like that? Um, I don't think we ever did it the justice that we could have. Okay. <laughs> I wish we had done it. It was actually, we, here's a funny story. I signed my contract with, with, uh, ECW and, and Paul said, you know, here's what we're going to do. We're going to put you, CW Anderson, and Steve Green together. And we're going to find a fourth member and you guys are going to be the extreme horsemen. We're going to wear suits, you know, blah, blah, blah. We're going to do all this. Now this is Paulie talking, so take it with the greatest thought. You know, <laughs> yeah. Like anything Paulie said. <laughs> but yeah, how is it? You know, it's, it's raining outside, and Paulie's sitting there telling you, it's a beautiful day, it's 90 degrees, let's go outside. <laughs> oh, it's raining. No, it's not. You know, that's Paul, I mean, you know, <clears throat> my favorite thing is, it is what it is, you are what you are. And Paulie, it, you know, he was what he was. Yeah. You know, I mean, if you took his, if you relied on his words, then you were the full not him. <laughs> so, uh Paul, you yeah, we're going to do this extreme horseman, blah, 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 blah. And then a week later, we were in Atlanta, and we were getting ready for the um, tag title tournament. And Dreamer came to me and goes, uh, you don't have a partner for this tag title tournament. We kind of need two more teams. So we've been thinking about you, and I can't remember who they said. Okay. But then he said, and I, and he said what do you think? And I looked over, and there was Swinger. And I said, you put me with him. And he goes, Swinger? I said, yeah, put me with Swinger. And he goes, well, why don't you guys, I was going to have you wrestle him tonight. And I said, oh. And he goes, well, I guess you, he goes, two of Dusty Rhodes students are here. This is what Dusty was about. Two of Dusty Rhodes students are here. You want to, you know, why don't you wrestle them? And I thought to myself, great, not only will I get to wrestle Dusty Rhodes students, but I'll have the dream watching my match. To, you know, give me a critique. So, bam, off it went. And then that changed Paulie's, uh, we just clicked in the beginning, so that kind of changed Paulie's course as far as, well, at least what he said. <laughs> as far as the extreme horse, pardon, <coughs> excuse me, are concerned. Now, fast forward that years later, uh, me, Carino, CW all in, um, MLW. And, you know, uh, I think it was Carino brought the Heating Horseman idea to Court Bauer and, and Court was all for it and we did it there. And, I mean, it was, it was a blast. I mean, you know, always enjoyed working with Steve, always enjoyed working with CW. Well, I'm sorry. I, w I was glad that we, I was glad that we did get to do it somewhere, because I always thought it, it really had, you know, I, I always thought a, a four-man contingency of me, Swinger, Carino, and CW would have been phenomenal. I was going to ask you, are you, were you surprised that, that MLW didn't get bigger than it was? Because when it first came out, I remember there was, you know, the, oh, we're going to, there's going to be this, and there's going to be, there was so much hype around it that I, I, I was always surprised that it didn't. Uh, you know, take off more than it did, and it's not still around today. Um, yeah, I was a little surprised. Uh, but, you know, then again, you have to look at the situation. If, you know, if you're ever really going to be a, a major player in this in this business, you have to have television. You know, and everyone will sit there and say, oh, that's going to be the death, that's going to be the death. Well, it's also going to be the lifeblood. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, one of the things that, you ask me what I'm, one of the things I'm most proud of is one of the things that I'm most proud of is when I go to the live events, to the house shows, and um, I'm the agent for the house shows, um, I do most of the domestic stuff, and Scott does most of the international stuff. 
And when I hear people raving about the house shows and saying, oh, wow, that was such a great experience, that was, you know, that's what wrestling should be, and, and I had a great time, and blah, 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 and, and that's, that's what I feel, that's what I take the most pride in, is at the end of the night when I stand in the ring with Kurt um, to do Polaroids, and I talk to the fans, they're like, hey, you're Simon Diamond, are you? I said, well, yeah, I was, but I'm not anymore, but how'd you like the show? If this was this show. If I had a nickel for every time someone said this show blew away the WWE when they were here two months ago, I'd be driving a uh, Range Rover yep. instead of a Dodge Durango. I mean, do you think a lot of that? Is, is, I'm just gonna say about you guys being excited because you didn't do house shows for a while, and now, it, I, like you said, it's, this isn't just a it's taking a, off. I mean, it's yeah. absolutely taking off. I mean, I'm sitting here. Today, I'm looking at my calendar for May and June, and I'm like, my birthday's in May, and I'm kind of like, well, I'm going to be away for my birthday, and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, but I, I love it. You know, I, I love going I love going to the live events. And, you know, that's where the guys, you know, pretty much can go out there and tear it up. And, and um, you know, we can – I think the biggest thing that we have to offer is we have a young, hungry locker room of young guys who aren't jaded. They're not jaded yet to the business where if they're wrestling in front of a thousand fans, they're just as happy. They don't, they, because they haven't wrestled in front of 30,000, 40,000, 50,000 fans, they, it's still young and fresh to them. Mm -hmm. And we can take advantage of that because these guys are, will, will go out there and they will do anything humanly possible within reason to excite the crowd. Absolutely. And it shows when they go out there and they're not going through the motions. They're not, you know, and I mean, I'll be the first one to tell you, there was, you know, many times during the house shows I was beat up and I just, you know, there was 800 fans out there and it, it just, you know, the crowd wasn't that enthusiastic, you know, and I may have given 85%, uh -huh. you know, and it's, I look back on them like, man, I shouldn't have done that. I should have been out there, you know. Because now I see the magic that you can create when you go out there and, and you give 100% and then you, you, you bring the fans into, into the match. And, and then afterwards when we try and go above and beyond. So we, we send people out there to sign autographs. Uh, we do a uh, segment at the end of the show where fans can get to the ring and have their picture taken with Kurt Angle. Um, for a fee, of course. <laughs> But there's, a, there's nothing free in life except for bad advice. Uh -huh. um, so we try and go above and beyond so that we can capture the consumer's dollar and take it away from our competitor. You know, I've heard numerous reports of the majority of the WWE live events, house shows are, you know, guys going out, you know, big entrance, four-minute match, next match. Yeah. You know, we don't do that. It's our our house shows, and live events are you know very wrestling oriented. Guys go out there, guys get that you know time in their matches, and 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 they get to you know excite the crowd. No, oh, absolutely. Well, I was gonna say before, when anybody listening to this, this is one of the, the things uh, I thought this is not just somebody worship TNA saying that the house shows are great. This is something that I've been hearing for a while. I mean, people come back from the house shows, and I was amazed when they first started happening. People were coming back. Saying exactly what you were saying, it seems like, uh, in some ways, it's, it's the amount of time that you guys waited before doing house shows. It seemed like you kind of built up the excitement, built up the enthusiasm by the time you guys were ready to do it. Uh, I mean, you, you put on pretty much great shows almost every time out whenever you do the house shows. So that's we had a guy, um, <clears throat> as everyone knows, uh, Tommy Dreamer, mm -hmm. came to our show in New York, along with uh, Little Guido. Well, to me, he's Little Guido, too. Um, WWE fans, he's not the okay. Also, um, a guy who used to work for the WWE in security, who lives in New York, came to the show as well. Okay. He came up to me at the end of the show, and he said, thank you so much, because this reminded me what wrestling used to be, and why I became a fan. Yeah. I changed, yeah, I just... I just said, you know, it, it, you couldn't have just given a greater compliment. You know, and, this, and, you know, it was just, 
the show that we did in Webster Hall was, you know, there was a thousand people there, but you would have thought, my wife went to the show, and she was like, that was the closest thing to a rock concert that I've ever, that I've ever been to outside of a rock concert. I mean, it was rabid. You know, she, she likened it to a cross between a rock concert and a Notre Dame game. And I, I took my wife out to Notre Dame um, several years ago to make sure that she enjoyed the experience so that I would, in fact, marry her. Because if she didn't enjoy this experience, I wouldn't have married her. Okay. <laughs> but uh, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it's, the Notre Dame fans and the Notre Dame faithful are very passionate. Um, they're very proud. You know, the alumni, the Subway alumni, they're very proud, they're very passionate about Notre Dame. A lot of people's lives revolve around that team. And she was just, you know, so, she couldn't believe how these wrestling fans were so passionate and so lively and so insane. Oh, yeah. She was like, it's a rock concert meet at the Notre Dame football game. And I was like, well, as long as it's either Van Halen or Kiss, we're okay. Yeah. And what it, and I was gonna say it's uh, it's almost exactly like a rock concert except instead of air guitar you got people trying to give their friends like the rock bottom and the uh, the, the ankle lock exactly. and stuff. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. But yeah, I mean you talk about the passion of fans and that's something that that I think TNA a lot of the wrestling companies have TNA actually has it uh, in a way that I, I don't see with anybody else in that you guys have fans who are passionate in both directions. I mean, there are some people, I, I watch wrestling and I watch TNA and I like the shows, but you know, there are certain times where I'm critical of this, critical of that, but there are some people where it's like, you know, if they don't like impact, they want to, they want to, you know, burn their house. I'm like, wait, wait. the people take it very, very seriously. And I want to ask you, we have Scott this too. Uh, is there ever a time where you, you read a, a critique uh, about the company online that you just say to yourself, what the hell is it? Like, what, what exactly is, is the, there's sometimes that you think people overanalyze it to the point where they're not going to enjoy it no matter what it is. I don't mind so much when the fans do it because as a fan of like the Yankees and Notre Dame, I mean, I do it. You know, I'm like, why do we call that play? Why aren't you bringing, you know, um, I went to the, when we were in Boston, I went, um, myself, Scott Demore, Mike Denae, Ross Foreman, and Don West. Uh, Brother Ray, I was about to call him Brother, Brother Ray, Brother Ray, um, Bruno and Tilly, Scott the Camel Guy. Don't ask me his last name, I just know Scott the Camel Guy. Big Red Sox fan. So we all went to the Red Sox Shanky game. So, for second and third, <clears throat> one out, Manny Ramirez com comes up, Mike Mussini's on the mound, and I turned to Don West and I said, well, this is, this is good. Uh, no, uh, pitching, Girardi walks out to the mound, talks to Mucini, comes back and said, oh, that's good. He just told him to put him on. And then the next thing I know, Mucini is pitching to Ramirez and he hits a double in the gap and I go crazy. Why are we pitching to Manny Ramirez? Pitch to Euclid. I'd much rather pitch to Euclid than Manny Ramirez. That, that's what wrestling fans do. They okay. critique everything usually on the negative side because that's human nature. Human nature is to always critique something negatively instead of positively because we believe as human beings we have the right answer as opposed to what we're seeing. Mm -hmm. You know, um, last night Joe Girardi, after a 30-minute rain delay, didn't bring Phil Hughes back. And the Yankees lost seven to six. Now the White Sox brought their pitcher back, Floyd, and they won. So the first thing I said is, why didn't he bring Hughes back? Well, we don't know, you know, the inner workings. So exactly, exactly. You know, but it doesn't. When fans do it, it's just kind of like, you know, they're just being fans. They're being pat. The problem comes when they don't have any feeling towards the product. Absolutely. You know. If the fans are being passionate about it, but I think there's some, what upsets me is when people on websites and, and stuff like that, they have an axe to grind, and then they have what I call either revisionist here, uh, revisionist history, or revisionist currency, meaning they're going to watch it, and what they like, they're going to pound home, that's good. What they don't like, they're going to pound home, that's bad. And, and that's wrong. That's wrong. Give us, you know, give us your opinion, but don't try and state it as a fact, as 
what this is what is good, this is what is bad. Tell us, I think this is good, here's why. I think this is bad, here's why. And I think a lot of writers, internet writers, um, wrestling um, sheet writers or whatever, try to take their opinion and base it as a fact. And then the wrestling fan turns around and, and you know, that person's word is gospel. Mm. That's wrong. That's wrong. Also, that one of the things I learned from doing this site in the last few years is that, and, and I spoke to a wrestler about this once, said that, you know, one of the problems that comes with a lot of these critiques sometimes is that guys don't know the personal things that are going on backstage, like a wrestler maybe won't go over and they'll say, well, that makes no sense, this guy should have been put over this guy, but they don't know that maybe that wrestler has a personal problem he has to attend to in two weeks. So he's sure, not gonna... or he may have a bad attitude, or he may have done something that put him, you know, um, upset management with him. I mean, how many times, you know, college, perfect example, um, such and such state university has... Um, declared defensive end Joe Davis um, suspended for, suspended indefinitely. Well, we don't know why they suspended him. They just suspended him. Wrestling is a similar way. We're not going to suspend you, but what we're going to do is we're going to take you and we're going to let you know, number one, we're not pleased with what it is that you did. And number two, now we're going to use you to help us. We were putting stock in you and we were building you up. And now something that's something, you've done something um, behind the scenes or in your match or something that has, you know, hurt the company. So what we're going to do now is we're going to try and repair that by using you to help us build somebody else up yep. until, you know, the time comes where we're going to start to, to rebuild you. Yeah. That, that's in any, it's, that's in any sport, that's in any business, that's, you know, but, but a lot of times, you know, you don't hear exactly what went on behind the scenes. Yeah, and by the time, sometimes you get a story that's, uh, that's so far from the truth that people think. A lot of times I read stories and I'm like, no, that's 40% true, that's 30% true, you know, but it's not all the way true. And if it was all the way true, then everyone would understand why it is that such and such happened. Yeah. One of my favorite stories to this day is D'Lo had said that he was at home on the internet and he hadn't left his house all day and he read that he had gotten stopped at the border for drugs. And he's like, I'm at my house. He's like, I've been, they had to call up and they said, oh, somebody looked like you. So you get off the internet. But it's, uh, it's crazy. People just have stories out of nowhere. But on the subject of, of critiques, this is something that I, I think affects a lot of the guys in the ring and, and as a producer, I wanted to know if you ever had to deal with this. One of the things that I do dislike about TNA, and this isn't something that you guys do, it's actually something from the fans, is I, during the pay-per-view sometimes in Orlando, you get really schizophrenic fan chants, where I still point to this day to the time that they, they chanted, fire Russo, and then a minute later they were chanting, this is awesome. And I said, well, if you fired Russo, it wouldn't have been awesome, because, you know, um, do you, is that hard to, to, A, do you have to find a lot of wrestlers that sometimes try to tailor their matches to the fans, you know, that are, that are chanting, and, and it's kind of hard to get a grip on, on what they want, especially for a younger wrestler in the ring dealing with that, and, and for you, how do you approach that when, uh, when fans are very vocal, but it kind of seems like they're, I don't say all over the place, but all over the place, and, and what they like and what they don't like in a match? I'm, I agree 100%. There's, there's a lot of wrestlers who are trying to cater to the live crowd that they're wrestling in front of instead of the TV masses. And when we're in Orlando, we're taping television or pay-per-view, we have to think of the masses because the bottom, at the end of the day, this is a business. And in any business, you have to generate money so that that business can continue to be profitable. And as long as it's profitable, then there'll be employee, employees and an employer the employer being TNA and the employees being all the wrestlers and all the producers and all the, you know, everyone involved. You have to always, 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 always think of the masses because with the masses comes the funds to fund the whole operation. When you segregate yourself to a small entity, you're going to cut off your cash flow to a certain, there's no, you're going to put a roof on it. You can't wrestle number one, for the internet. You can't wrestle number two when you're wrestling, you know, 
on television, you have to think masses, not really live crowd, so to speak. Yeah. You can control, I've always thought this, and I'll think until the day night, you can always control the crowd that you're wrestling in front of. If you know what you're doing, you can control the crowd. Little subtle things you can do to sway them, and they start chanting for you. If you're a heel and they start chanting for you as a face, you can, you can sway them. It's, you know, it's not that hard. Look, I, I think there's that, there are, there are wrestlers that, <clears throat> unfortunately, they want to get on the internet and they want to read that they had a five star match. Well, that may not generate into a money drawing match or it may not continue the angle that they're doing and it may not be, be good for their character. I mean, we've had several guys who were heels who were wrestling as faces. We've had several guys who were faces wrestling as heels. You know, it's, it, you know, the whole thing is you have a character and that character is defined by what it is that you say, what it is that you do, and how you wrestle. And when you cross the lines, then it becomes clouded. I agree with you. That's, I mean, that's one of the things. And one of the questions I have for you, too, is that to be able to make those changes that you talk about, that's something that obviously, you know, you picked up through the years, but it's also something that I've heard as a complaint from, from trainers and from, from you know, uh, some guys who, who had wrestled through the territories is that a lot of guys today, some of them don't know how to, how to change their match around uh, to kind of, not necessarily cater to the crowd, but to, to kind of call it in the ring and be able to, to make improvisations to maybe bring the crowd back onto their side, like you said before. Do you find that some guys just simply don't know how to do it or maybe just try and go about it the wrong way? Uh, they, they don't know how to do it because they've never been taught, because the people that they're working with don't know it either. Yeah. I mean, you know, the majority of the young guys that are wrestling today don't... <clears throat> They, they weren't wrestling in the time of, you know, what I what I call walking and talking. You know, where you would go, you know, you would maybe, um, you know, to talk about a couple things in the back and then go out there and um, just walk and talk. And today everything is A to Z because that's, you know, the internet is more, it's, it's more prevalent than wrestling, so the, the internet wants to see wrestling as an Olympic sport, where it's judged on the athleticism. Absolutely, yeah. The only way to do that is if everything is become so, you know, calculated. Yeah. The no. real, you know, the money drawing aspect of wrestling comes from the characterization. People pay money to see characters. They always have, and they always will. Branding, marketing, the whole, the whole nine. I, I know we're getting to the end here, so I'm just gonna I'm gonna start finishing it up. Uh, but one of the last questions I had to ask you, and I would I would definitely be remiss if I didn't. You're actually the last member of the Diamonds in the Rough set that we had to have on in order to to complete the Diamonds in the Rough set, I guess. Uh, you know, Elix <laughs> Kipper was one of the one of the first ones we had on. Uh, David Young just a, a few months ago. Uh, and I want to get from you about working with them because one of the things that surprised me, uh, you know, David's friends with uh, with Bull Buchanan, who who actually uh, you know does a show on on the site, and I was amazed. And just how funny David Young is. He, he's very different than I expected him to be from watching him on television. Uh, and, and I wonder, from you working with those guys and, and being with Elix and David Young, what was that experience like for you, and, and what did you think about working with them? That was great. David's a very witty guy, very funny, very witty. Um, Elix, athletically, may not have a peer in the ring, I mean, as far as what he can do athletically. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I had a blast working with those guys. It was a lot of fun, and, you know, it was uh, the baseball thing that we did was great. And, um, you know, we just—it was a lot of fun. It was—it was a lot of fun. Yeah, I think it was a memorable kind of, uh, and it was such a great usage. I think of all three of you guys because it was at a yeah. point where you guys were all doing something, but uh, one of those things where the three of you guys together, I think, uh, did so much more than than you were doing at the time. Yeah, individually, most certainly. Absolutely. Well, one of the last questions I want to ask you: We ask all of our guests this. Uh, if you could choose anybody. Maybe somebody you came up watching. Maybe somebody you just never were in the same company with. They always said, uh, I wish I could have wrestled or, or worked with this person. Uh, who would you pick? Man. Um, I would have liked to have wrestled Flair. Uh-huh. Uh, I would have liked to have wrestled Tully. That would have been awesome. You know, another guy I would have liked to wrestle is Kurt. Kurt Angle? Yeah. Have you had the 
chance now to like to work out with him uh, in, in TNA at all, or get to do some things in the ring with him? Have I gotten a chance to work out with him? Yeah, like in, in the ring, but before the matches, obviously not on television. Why would I ever want to do that? <laughs> <laughs> I'm an agent now. I have no desire to, you know, I would not want to put myself in harm's way. <laughs> You know, and that's one of the reasons why I would have liked to wrestle him. You know, I, I sit there and I watch him, like, man, this guy is taking people's heads off and he's moving at a thousand miles an hour. And, you know, I just look and I go, what if I keep up with him? Yeah. You know, that's, I, that's, that's more just like a pride thing. Um, you know, but, uh, I mean, Kurt, he's legit. You know, he's, you know, people talk about this guy's a tough guy, this guy's a shooter, this guy's, uh, this guy's a badass, this guy's this, this guy's that, you know, and the bottom line is the guy's an Olympic gold medalist, number one, and uh, number two, he's, you know, he's a phenomenal pro wrestler, um, you know, I think, you know, another guy I'd like to wrestle is Joe, because his style, Samoa Joe, his style is so different Yeah. Um, than everybody else's. I think. But it's a throwback in a way, too. I, I like it's yeah. almost like... It's I mean, when he first came into TNA and he was seen nationally for the first time, it was so different. It was like, wow, this is different. There's been a lot of experiences that you guys have had. I remember with TNA, is that there's been so many times where you guys would, would debut somebody, and it was, it was such a different start. Even Sanjay Dutt, I remember back on the Wednesday pay-per-views, that first week that he came out, the player from the Himalayas, and it was... Uh, it was just such a different thing for people to see, which is one of the good things about TNA is that you guys showcase talent that uh, maybe WWE feels, you know, quote unquote, doesn't fit into into their mold. But in the end, I mean, it, it makes good usage, and I think the fans are, are eager to see people like that. Sure. Uh, again, um, you know, different. It's being different. Absolutely. You know, it's 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 here's you know here's what our competitor does, now we need to do something a little different to try and sway the market. You know, that's all. Absolutely. And, and again, that's why I, I say I take so much pride in <coughs> when people say <coughs> how great <coughs> the live events are. And, you know, it's like, well, I'm glad that people are enjoying that because you know, I mean, I remember growing up and when you went to live events, you, you know, it was, there was so much um, excitement because you were getting to see the, you were getting to see it live, number one, and number two, it, it was, you know, different than what you were watching on television. Yeah. It was match, 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 match. Absolutely. They would actually even do angles too sometimes that they wouldn't play out on television. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I was there, I think they did a, a NASA Coliseum, they had one thing where, where Luger and, and Razor Ramon, they were both heels, kind of went into it, and I said, oh, one of these guys is going to turn, turn good on TV, and then it didn't happen for like a year, and you kind of felt like you were, you saw something special that no one else knew about. You saw something that happened before it actually happened. Absolutely. Totally. Well, Pat, before I let you go, uh, we give all of our chan uh, all of our guests a chance to just uh, speak directly to their fans, so to all the... Uh, the Simon Maniacs that are out there that have been with you from, from ECW uh, through MLW through today, uh, what do you have to say to your fans out there? Uh, it was a great 15 years or whatever it is that I wrestled and I had a lot of fun. And hopefully I can stay in this wonderful um, business with TNA for 15 more years or, or however long they'll have me. And, you know, I, I don't, I don't have a website anymore, and I really don't plan on wrestling ever again. So, I guess the best thing I can say is watch Impact on Thursday nights on Spike Television. Go to the TNA live events when they come to your area because you will see what wrestling should be and what it was. Absolutely. Everybody out there, if you guys go to the TNA live events, send us a report, too, if you do. We'll uh, we'll put it up on the site. We'd love to hear about your experiences at the, at the live events, uh, especially TNA as they, they go just across the world at this point, just uh, starting to do shows everywhere there is. Uh, Pat Kenny, Simon Diamond, either name I want to use, I want to thank you again for taking the time to talk to us this week. Thank you, James. It was a lot of fun.